I'm Anna Leonard, I'm one of the um, dietitians that's working in ICU and I normally do the, the ICU reg TAT and then after the TAT at, um, what we can do is I can share a list of the feeds that we have available um, in the hospital um, with the kind of features and indications with you. And then, of course, I can make the, the slideshow um, available for those who are interested in looking back at it. So, um, firstly, I can just get my buttons to work. Um, all right, so if we look at critical illness, critical illness is associated with, mal with malnutrition, and this is a worldwide phenomenon. Um, critically ill patients quite quickly develop malnutrition, or we aggravate the pre-existing uh, malnutrition, and this is predominantly due to the inflammatory response, the metabolic stress that they are under while they are in the ICU, and then also bed rest um, while we while we um, providing critical care to them. And all of this leads to an increase in the catabolism, which is characterized by a breakdown in the skeletal muscle mass. Um, this process we can only partially mitigate by providing aggressive nutrition um, to these patients, um, but this can also last for weeks after the, the ICU discharge. So despite the fact that there's numerous guidelines available and that there's a lot written about the importance of um, nutrition and providing adequate nutrition support to patients in the ICU, we still find that patients on discharge from ICU presents with a lot of weakness and a lot of, of weight loss. And the reason for that is that the consequences of malnutrition is, um, is difficult to, to measure. It takes a long time for it to become obvious, and often only after um, ICU discharge, we, we see how malnourished um, these patients are. So if we, if we look at patients um, or at studies, there are several studies that compare the prescribed calories to the delivered calories and protein in the ICU. And what we find is that on average, patients only receive about 50% of the nutrition that is prescribed to them. Um, while they are in ICU under our care. And then your surgical subgroup of patients is even less likely to, to achieve their the full nutritional goals um, while, while they are in the ICU, more so than, than our medical patients. So if we just quickly look at the role of the dietitian in critical care, um, this study that was published in 2010 showed that there's a direct correlation between the number of dietitians that works in the ICU and enhanced provision of nutrition support, earlier initiation of enteral nutrition, better compliance to the um, available guidelines, and then achieving at least 80% of the, of the target energy. And you get that the more dietitians is involved in ICU, um, there's more strategies um, try in, in trying to optimize um, nutrition delivery to our patients. This is another um, study also from 2010 and one from 2006, um, which also looked at the role of, of dietitians in critical care and found that if you have a dietitian working in the ICU and there's an enteral feeding protocol that you're using in your ICU like we do here, you get improvement in energy provision, you get increased use of combination feeding to achieve um, targets, and you get a decrease in the inappropriate use of DBN. And this then all translates into a significantly shorter length of stay if your enteral nutrition was by a critical care um, dietitian. So if we just quickly touch on screening versus assessment um, when we talk about nutrition. So screening is a rapid, simple process that can be done by any healthcare professional. Um, it should be done to all patients that, it, that is admitted to a healthcare facility. And in most instances, um, or in internationally, this is something that is predominantly done by the nursing staff. So what you need is a validated tool. Um, you can use the NRS 2002 interested in that um, I can show you what that looks like and we can go into a bit more detail but basically what a screening tool tells you is one of four things either your, your patient is not at risk of malnutrition or currently malnourished and that patient you will just monitor and rescreen or you have a patient that is at risk but a kind of standard plan um, will suffice like a patient that comes in doesn't have teeth uh, maybe needs a soft diet that's something that that nursing staff um, can sort out at ward level or you have a patient that is at risk but a standard plan is not going to suffice for that patient or you have the one where you wonder is that patient at risk or not and it's really at those last two um, categories that the dietitian then becomes involved and important 
because then we go over to what we call assessment, which is a detailed examination that can only be done by a dietitian. It includes history taking, it includes an examination and an evaluation of the functional status of the patient. Other medical therapies need to be considered, biochemistry um, comes into play, and also a clinical assessment of the patient. And that then leads to a specific nutrition plan, which involves a specialized route and a specialized formula to be used in that patient. So if we just quickly look at what the, the guidelines say about screening and assessment, according to ASPEN, um, nutrition risk screening should be performed on all patients for whom um, volutional intake is, is an, anticipated to be insufficient. So they suggest the Nutrix score, the NRS. If you're not familiar with um, the acronyms ASPEN and ESPEN, so ASPEN is the American Society for Parenteral Nutrition, Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, while ESPEN is the European Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. The ESPEN guidelines are slightly newer than the ASPEN guidelines for about three years. They were published last year, um, while the ASPEN guidelines was, was updated in 2016. So ESPEN um, says that you should um, maybe follow a more pragmatic approach. You should look at your at-risk patients, of, at those that are staying in ICU for more than two days, those that is mechanically um, ventilated, those with infections, or those that is underfed for more than five, five days or presents with severe um, chronic diseases. So if we then just look at... Um, the kind of approach that we follow when we when we look at um, nutrition intervention in these patients so firstly we will look at requirements then we'll look at the route that you're going to follow um, that you when you feed the patient and then you basically have to choose between enteral or parenteral or a combination of the two routes and then we've got different formulas within the enteral or parenteral um, range that we can that we can um, incorporate into the patient's management. So in terms of formula, enteral formula, there's all your polymeric, semi-elemental, elemental, and we touch on that a bit later. And then in terms of your PN formulas, specifically we need to look at lipids, glutamine, and then your different um, compositions, your three chamber or your all-in-one bag. So if we start um, with requirements, um, Firstly, I would like to start looking at, at refeeding syndrome. So re, refeeding syndrome is something that we've known about for about 70 years um, after um, the Second World War. But up till today, refeeding syndrome in the ICU is something that we still don't quite understand um, completely. So if we look at what refeeding syndrome is, when you starve a patient, you get a decrease in your glucose levels within about, or any um, even healthy volunteer, there's a decrease in your glucose levels within 24 to 72 hours. You get an increase in glucagon with a decrease in insulin. Um, and this then leads to glyco glycogenolysis, which depletes those stores in about 72 hours max. And then you need to go on um, to gluconeogenesis in order to try and, and continue a substrate supply um, for the body to function. So if you had a vo healthy volunteer that you were starving, you would get a decrease in their met metabolic rate of about 25%. And they will burn predominantly fat um, to try and, and make some energy from that. And then you will see a loss of body fat and protein and you'll get a depletion. of refeeding so this is a cell if you can imagine that the red is the serum while the blue is um, the the cell so when you introduce nutrition in a patient you get you give glucose um, that leads to a decrease in glucagon and an increase in insulin that insulin then moves the glucose to the inside of the cell but with that you move a whole lot of your electrolytes, specifically phosphate, potassium, and magnesium intracellularly. At the same time, and we don't quite understand this, we see that patients with refeeding develop a um, degree of insulin resistance. And this insulin resistance causes retention of water and sodium at the level of the kidney. So what you then get is a patient that's fluid overloaded and hyponatremic, while they present with hypophosphatemia, hypermagnesemia and hypo um, uh, and, and a low low potassium level so at the same time so this happens because you are phosphorylating ADP to ATP and then that further decreases your your phosphate level 
And at the same time, thiamine is involved as a cofactor here. So you get a decrease in thiamine, which leads then to lactic acidosis. So this is what we then see clinically in patients that, that um, develop refeeding syndrome. So when we talk about um, refeeding syndrome, that's really an uh, umbrella term for a whole lot of metabolic and electrolyte derangements that we see in these patients, but it's characterized by hypophosphatemia. And per definition, refeeding syndrome or refeeding hypophosphatemia is a decrease in your serum phosphate of le to less than 0.65 millimoles per liter within 72 hours of starting nutrition or a decrease of more than 0.16 millimoles per liter from any previous level, which is something that you can quite easily see in a patient. So if a patient had a phosphate level of 1.5 the day before, and now today it's 1, although it's still normal, that per definition would mean that this patient is developing refeeding um, hypophosphatemia. Um, refeeding syndrome, on the other hand, is when you have all the, the features of fluid overload, um, hyponatremia, the, the insulin resistance, and all of that. So that's what we're trying to avoid by introducing nutrition slowly in these patients. So if we just quickly look at some evidence for refeeding in critical illness. So this study was published in 2017. And what they did was they looked at the impact of calorie intake in patients who developed refeeding syndrome and those who didn't develop refeeding syndrome. So they had 337 patients admitted to ICU who were receiving mechanical, mechanical ventilation for more than seven days. And they identified 124 patients who developed refeeding syndrome and 213 who had normal serum levels. And they then looked at each of them whether they received more than 50% or less than 50% of their requirements by, the, by day three. This is an observational study. It wasn't um, an interventional thing. Um, so what they found was that if they restricted, if the patients received less, or the, the population that didn't develop refeeding syndrome um, had higher serum phosphate levels, which is obvious, and they required less replacement of the phosphate, of course, because the phosphate levels wasn't really that um, low. On the other hand, if you, um, developed ref the, if you developed refeeding syndrome, you required more um, potassium replacement, and you also required more insulin because patients became insulin resistant. Then if they looked at the survival curves, they saw that at about two weeks, these curves separate and your patients that that didn't develop refeeding syndrome um patients that didn't didn't develop refeeding syndrome and received less than 50 percent of the so the, the middle ones was patients that didn't develop refeeding syndrome and received less than 50 percent of their calories or they they um didn't receive um they didn't develop refeeding syndrome develop more than 50 percent. so they were kind of more or less the same whereas if you developed refeeding syndrome and you were receiving more than 50% of your calorie target by day three, there was a, a decreased survival in, in that patient group. So then there was another study by Doik in 2015, which looked at if your patient now develops refeeding syndrome and you restrict the calories, does it actually make a different outcome? So again, um, <clears throat> it was a multi-centric um, study from 13 ICUs in Australia and New Zealand. And they um, restricted calories if patients dropped their phosphate within 48, within 72 hours of starting nutrition support. So then they cut the calories back to 20 kilocalories per, ki per hour, which is about 21 moles per hour like um, we provide to patients. So what they found is the standard care group is the red one and the calorie management group is the blue one. So um, patients where the calories were restricted um, they, re they required um, less intravenous phosphate replacement. And they also found that they had a lower um, blood glucose level because they were less um, insulin resistant. And they also had lower lactic levels because they didn't develop the lactic acidosis from the thiamine deficiency. <coughs> and then again, if you look at overall survival, and again at about 14 days um, since admission to ICU, the ones where the standard care group where calories weren't restricted had a poorer survival than patients um, who, who got full calories. So if you have a patient in ICU that dropped their phosphate, um, our approach at this point is to then restrict their calories, replace their phosphate, and then start building them up again. Because at the, at the end of the day, that seems to have a, a survival benefit. Why calorie restriction works in these patients is poorly understood. 
Um, what can be hypothesized is that hypophosphatemia leads to cellular dysfunction and is an independent risk factor for infection, sepsis, and shock. And insulin resistance, on the other hand, also increases your, your risk for infection and, sep and sepsis. So this is just the algorithm kind of in terms of how we should manage patients with refeeding syndrome. So we need to supplement the electrolytes aggressively. We need to monitor their glucose. They need to receive um, intravenous insulin if they're hypoglycemic. We need to correct for fluid overload if necessary because they also retain a lot of fluid, so we shouldn't um, over, over, give them too much fluid and overload them. They need thiamine supplementation. And then we should restrict their total calories to about 500 calories for the first 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours during refeeding while we replace the, the phosphate, and then increase the calories slowly with, at about 25% until we meet 25% per day until we meet their requirements. The important thing here, and we'll talk about that later as well, is that we need to take the amount of non-nutritional calories that's coming from things like propofol citrate. We don't really use in renal replacement therapy here, but then also intravenous carbohydrate solutions into account. So it doesn't help the dietitian restricts the feeds on the one side, but the patient receives the extra screening IV fluids on the other hand. Then we're not restricting the, the total calories at the end of the day. So if we come back to requirements, requirements in general are difficult to predict in patients. Um, it varies over time points, um, not even over days, but also within a day, whether the patient has just been washed or turned or had physio um, all of, or has got a temperature, all of that can increase or decrease your, your patient's requirements. So at the moment, the, the recommendation is that we should use indirect calorimetry in these patients, but unfortunately that, with, especially within the South African setting, has got li limited availability and it's also associated with more cost than just the dietitian standing at the foot of the bed and estimating something. Um, so then the next option is to use a predictive equation. There's about 200 of them available. Um, but the problem there is that we often don't have an accurate weight and height, and we use a subjective stress factor. And then also these um, predictive equations are not that accurate, and the, the rates range between about 40 and 75% in accuracy if you compare them to indirect calorimetry. Then the other option is to use a simple weight-based recommendation, which we often talk about in ICUs, your 25 to 30 um, kilocalorie um, per kilo um, range, which I think is what we currently are using the most in, in the ICU setting. So if we look at what the ESPEN and ASPEN guidelines say, they both recommend that you use indirect calorimetry. So they've, ESPEN has dropped the, the recommendation a little bit, so you will start with about 20 to 25 calories per kilo of total energy, and they promote that you should feed hypercaloric nutrition in the early phase, which is about the first three days of ICU admission. And then we increase to about 25 to 30 kilocalories per day of total energy. Um, if, you, if you're using indirect calorimetry, they say you can go up and provide 100% of, um, of, of what your machine tells you you should be giving. If you're using a predictive equation, they recommend that you stick to about 70% of that, which is about 20 kilocalories per kilo for the first week um, in ICU. Um, basically, because you're not quite sure what you're doing and you don't want to be overfeeding the patient in that time. I think at the moment with um, the COVID patients that we, are, that we are seeing, and because they're so heavily sedated, per kilo um, range than, than going up to 25 and 30 calories in that case. So then if we look at the protein requirements, Aspen says 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram with a higher range of 2 more for your patients with burns, traumatic brain injury and trauma. Giving more than 2 doesn't really correlate with an improved outcome. And then ESPEN um, gives a more conservative um, recommendation saying that you should give at least 1.3 grams per kilogram of protein equivalent, which is about 1.6 grams per kilogram. So we often in ICU aim for about 1.3 to 1.5 grams per kilo um, when we feed these patients. Um, but then we'll talk about renal replacement in patients with open abdomens and that kind of thing because that does um, push your requirements up a bit. So just important again to touch on this, that your, your um, energy intake from all sources need to be accounted for. 
So you need to take your dextrose containing IV fluids um, into account. And then importantly, you need to take propofol into account. So propofol is in 100% um, soybean lipid emulsion, um, a 10% emulsion. So one mole of propofol is equal to 0.1 grams of fat, which gives you one calorie. If, you've, if you have patients on propofol of two moles per hour or five moles per hour, that probably doesn't make as much of a difference um, to, to the total calories delivered for the day. But if we're talking about higher um, administrations of propofol, like we're also seeing now, if you're talking about 15 and 20 moles per hour of propofol running, that's, that's providing a patient about 500 calories for the day. So that's substantial and you need to then um, account for that in your nutrition prescription. So then if we move on to requirements in your more um, specialized group, so if we look at the obese patients, so um, we all kind of acknowledge that if we get a patient in ICU with a very low BMI, those patients are high nutrition risk. However, on the other hand, when we get a very large patient in ICU, I think the urgency to feed those patients is a little bit less um, than, than what we find with our very thin patients. But what we need to remember is that malnutrition occurs on both sides of the spectrum, although it's much less apparent when your patient is obese. Um, but 75% of patients, of hospitalized patients with a BMI, BMI of more than, um, especially then if you start going to the higher BMI ranges over 30, um, BMI over 30 is 1.5 times more likely to be malnourished than patients with normal BMIs being admitted to hospital. And if you look in terms of mortality, there's a U-shaped curve. So um, you find that your mortality is highest in your class three severely obese patients, so patients with a BMI more than 40, and then also patients with a BMI less than 25. So it appears as if the lowest mortality um, is for BMI of about 30 to 40. Um, so it seems to be to be moderately obese seems to be a little bit protective when you when you get admitted to ICU, and that's referred to as the obesity paradox. So in terms of obese patients in the ICU, they're more likely to have problems with fuel utilization, um, and that predisposes them to a greater loss of lean body mass. Um, they are at a higher risk of insulin resistance and more, and they do more futile um, fuel cycling of the lipid metabolism. Um, so if you look at a study that they did on obese trauma patients, they found that um, surgical ICU, obese patients in ICU derived 30%, 39% of their resting energy expenditure um, from fat, whereas their lean counterparts, um, no, sorry, the lean patients um, used about 39% of the of the resting energy. No, sorry, I'm I'm wrong there. So. <laughs> Fat patients derive less of their resting energy expenditure from fat um, versus their, their lean counterparts. So they burn more of their lean um, body mass to try and make energy from that. So they, they end up burning protein um, to, to, to provide energy. So when we feed these patients, we need to try and preserve their lean body mass um, while we kind of allow them to mobilize the, the adipose stores and try and minimize metabolic complications, things like um, very poorly controlled blood glucose. And then also just the, the um, things of turning the patient, washing the patient, that kind of thing for nursing staff, of course, is a, is a, a major factor. So if we can try and, and allow a little bit of weight loss, but then you want the patient to burn fat, you don't want them to become weak and burn burn the, the lean body mass. So if we look at requirements, the idea is to feed them a high protein, hypocaloric feed. So we feed, if you could do indirect calorimetry, you would provide about 65 to 70% of what you measure. Or if you don't have indirect calorimetry, we um, calculate the energy. So we use a far lower requirement of 11 to 14 calories per kilo on the actual weight. So on the fat weight, you provide them at 11 to 14 versus your, your lean counterpart, we would give about 25 to 30. Or if the BMI is more than 50, we work out the ideal body weight, we then provide them 22 to 25 um, kilocalories per kilo. Protein wise, we give them a lot more. So BMI of 30 to 40, you work out the ideal body weight. So they lean non-fat body weight and you give them two grams per kilogram for that. And if they have a BMI of more than 40, you give 2.5 grams per kilogram. Having said that, 
it's very difficult to then actually find a feed formula that you can provide these amounts with. So a lot of the time what we still do is to follow the ESPN guideline. We work out an adjusted body weight. So we work out the difference between the actual fat body weight and the ideal body weight. And we give them 25% of that difference back as an adjusted body weight. Um, and then we provide about 25 to 50 calories on the adjusted body weight. And same as what you would do with your, with your normal weight patients, um, about 1.3 grams per kilogram of the adjusted body weight. And we are seeing a lot of, of these obese patients in ICU at the moment. Um, able to, to hit those correct targets in terms of providing them with enough protein so that they don't burn their lean body mass, but not to overfeed them on the energy side and push up their the blood glucose. So if we then um, move over to the next kind of subset of patients that we see are those with the open abdomens. Um, they are the most hypercatabolic of all surgical patients and they will remain that way until the abdomen is closed. So even long after you've forgotten, you've discharged them from ICU, if they're still lying in the ward with that open abdomen, they still have enormously high um, requirements. So for them, we calculate the energy and their protein requirements separately. So we feed them non-protein energy. So that's energy only coming from fat and carbohydrate, the 25 to 35 calories. And then we add on top of that protein of about 1.5 to 2.5, which you will see is quite a bit higher than the 1.2 to 2 that we that we were talking about as a range for, for your normal patient. Um, then also, if you have these patients with open abdomens with high amounts of effluent coming either out of the open abdomen or from the fistula, quickly look at patients in ICU with acute kidney injury. If you look at the different stages of acute kidney injury, stage one acute kidney injury, which I think we very um, really even acknowledge in ICU has got minimal effect on their resting energy expenditure. And there you will just um, use your caloric requirements to target the underlying disease. So whatever reason the patient is in the ICU for that is what you will provide them in calories with. Um, they've got minimal catabolism and they, they're often not dialyzed. So you can then just restrict protein to about 0.8 to 1 grams per kilogram for the couple of days. And that normally resolves quite quickly. So you're not going to be restricting protein in these patients for a prolonged period of time. Then if we move to stage 2 and 3 acute kidney injury, they have an increase in their energy expenditure. So they average about 27 kilocalories per kilo per day in a ventilated patient. And then depending on the mode of renal replacement therapy that you're using, um, those patients will, will need more protein. So if you're using a continuous um, mode of, of dialysis, um, the protein requirements goes quite high to about 1.8 to 2.5 grams per kilo per day. Um, whereas your patients that receive um, intermittent hemodialysis or SLED, um, we normally aim for about 1.5 grams per kilo there. So if we just look at what Aspen says, um, the Aspen guidelines don't have a specific requirement for patients with acute kidney injury, but Aspen, the 2016 guidelines say that you should use energy of about 25 to 30. And then with your protein, you're going to aim for 1.2 to 2 with your renal replacement, your continuous renal replacement up to 2.5 grams per kilo. Um, just because patients are often fluid restricted and we don't have Pro, um, we don't have protein containing formula that contains more than 100 grams per liter. Um, we almost never get to the 2.5 grams per kilo, but we do try and, and provide at least 1.8 grams per kilo in those patients. So in terms of, of um, formula that we use, um, we use a standard formula in these patients and we'll only consider a speciality formula if the electrolyte, if electrolyte abnormalities develop. So if you have a patient with renal failure, dialyzed or not dialyzed with normal electrolytes, you're not going to go for electrolyte free kind of feed or an electrolyte free TPN. You only do that once you run into issues with your, with your electrolytes. So if we come back to this, so we've looked at requirements now, now we're just quickly going to touch on the root. I'm looking at enteral and parenteral, and then we'll come back to the formula. So um, if your patient is able to eat, then I'm not sure why is in ICU, but then yes, we should use the oral route over the enteral or the parenteral route. Um, if the patient can't eat, then Espen says we should um, establish early enteral nutrition within 48 hours of admission. And early enteral nutrition is then preferred over early PN. And in our units, we are quite good at establishing early enteral nutrition in these patients. Um, I think partly because of our um, feeding protocol in the units, but also because of the, the nursing staff that's quite used to 
to starting patients on feeds. And I think we, we have a very pro nutrition team working in the ICU. So patients get admitted and they'll start on something. If there's a contraindication to oral or enteral nutrition um, and you want to consider TP, you should consider TPN. The ESPN guidelines say within three to seven days, um, but only once you've tried all strategies to improve enteral tolerance. So you've tried your prokinetic, you've tried your postpyloric feeding tube, um, then you should consider TPN within three to seven days. If your patient is ever malnourished, then you should start earlier TPN, but then you need to consider that that patient might develop refeeding syndrome. So you should then increase your TPN slowly. The um, ESPN guidelines say that you should avoid early full EN or PN. Like we discussed, you're going to feed at about 70% of your calculated requirements. And then by day three to seven, you want to be meeting requirements. Supplemental PN, so those patients that's not meeting their full amount of calories via the intro route at about day four to seven, we should start considering supplemental PN, but that should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. So if you have a malnourished patient that you think is probably not going to tolerate well in the coming days, then you should probably start if you've got somebody that's quite well nourished and early and they're not fully tolerating EN, but you think within a day or so they will resolve, then it's maybe worthwhile to hold off for a bit. Then in the ESPN um, recommendation, there's also some special conditions that are referred to in cases where EN should be delayed. And most of these things refer to patients that's unstable. So if you've got a patient in uncontrolled shock or um, life-threatening hypoxemia, or they have an active upper GI bleed, or they've got bowel ischemia, um, these patients you're not going to, to attempt to feed. Um, then there's maybe the less obvious ones, your patients with a high output fistula. Um, you can try and feed that patient. We're probably not going to um, provide them with, with enough um, feeds, but just using the intro route. Um, or then your patient with abdominal compartment syndrome. And if you are aspirating more than 500 moles um, from the gastric aspirate in, in six hours, you should withhold or delay your EN. You can start low-dose EN in patients um, that's receiving therapeutic hypothermia. In patients with intra-abdominal hypertension where there isn't abdominal compartment syndrome yet. And then in patients with acute liver failure when you've kind of stabilized them and they're out of the immediate life-threatening um, stage, then you can start low-dose EN in those patients. And then we, we should be giving um, enteral nutrition. And I think sometimes we're scared to give enteral nutrition, so we withhold it. But patients with ECMO, traumatic brain injury, patients after the stroke, spinal cord injury, acute pancreatitis, early after GI surgery, after abdominal aortic surgery. Um, if a patient has had abdominal trauma, but they've repaired the, the GI tract, patients with neuromuscular blocking agents, which we're seeing a lot now, or patients in the prone position should be fed, a patient with the open abdomen should be fed. Um, and then we shouldn't be waiting for bowel sounds before we, we feed patients. Um, if, if you know that there isn't bowel ischemia or obstruction, patients should be started on feet. So Aspen, um, the Americans also agrees, yes, we should start early within 20 to 48 hours of admission. In your high risk, um, severely malnourished patient, they also um, caution against patients developing refeeding syndrome and that you should try and provide more than 80% of requirements within 72 hours and use EN over PN. They differ from Aspen with regards to when to start PN. And what's important to understand here is that the Americans don't have very good parenteral nutrition products. So up until the time that these guidelines were published, they didn't have fish oil containing lipid emulsions registered for use in America. So um, their guideline is based on the fact that their the lipids is very pro-inflammatory and therefore they try and restrict the use in, in the early days of ICU admission. So they say if you've got a low risk patient, Low, risk, low nutrition risk patient, then don't give them TPN for the first seven days. However, if you've got a malnourished patient, then you should um, start PN as soon as possible. And then supplemental T PN, they, they say to consider that after seven to 10 days of not being able to meet at least 60% of, of your requirement. And then we should reduce and finally discontinue the use of PN when patients are tolerating more than 60% um, of the requirements from, from enteral nutrition. If we just quickly look at gastric residual volumes, and this is something that we still religiously 
do in our patients. Um, as per the 2016 guidelines say that it shouldn't be part of routine care in medical patients, but in surgical patients, we should maybe still be doing it. If you are doing it, you should not delay or withhold um, enteral nutrition for a gastric residual volume of less than 500 moles if there is no other signs of intolerance like abdominal distension um, or severe diarrhea. Residuals. So basically you shouldn't do it as part of routine care for medical patients. We should probably consider it in surgical patients. And if you're doing it, don't, don't withhold feeds if the gastric residual volume is less than 500 moles in a six hour period. Um, in terms of prokinetics, at the moment, ESPEN says that we should use erythromycin IV as a first-line therapy at 250 milligrams eight hourly, or alternatively, you can use IV metoclopramide um, 10 milligrams eight hourly or a combination of therapies. What we are still doing at the moment is to start um, metoclopramide and then we'll add erythromycin as a second line um, if we don't get much effect with, with the metoclopramide. But you just need to, to um, keep in mind that patients do develop resistance to to these drugs so you kind of need to keep it in your back pocket and use it at a time where you think you're likely to be able to introduce um enteral feeds don't give it when the nasogastric drainage is two liters because you're unable you probably won't be able to to establish enteral feeds in in those patients all right so then i was having some issues with my Thing is, okay, so um, the ESPEN guidelines and, and ESPEN, ESPEN guidelines still both agree that nasogastric feeding should be the routine route to use. But then, if you do run into trouble, to consider small bowel feeding um, in that case and then go for something like a nasogeginal tube um, to improve enteral tolerance. So, if we then um, that's with regards to the route. So, if we then look at formula in terms of your enteral formulas and your parenteral formulas. Um, firstly, in TPN, there's, there's two, maybe three things that distinguish um, one TPN regimen from the other. The first one is your lipid emulsion that you use. The other one is whether your bag contains glutamine or not, and then whether you're using a three-chamber or all-in-one bag, which we will look at just now. So in terms of lipid emulsions, um, Lipid, emulsion, uh, lipid has got some nutritional properties, so it's a concentrated source of energy. It contains some essential fatty acids that to provide your patients with, and then it's also a source of your fat-soluble vitamins. The other thing is if you provide patients with some fat, you can give them less carbohydrate um, because you're um, providing them with a concentrated source of energy and that improves your blood glucose control. But importantly, IV lipid emulsions has got an immune modulating effect. So if we look at IV lipid emulsions, um, they basically come from one of three classes, so either omega-3, omega-6, or omega-9. Um, fatty acids and that comes from fish oil, your soybean or your safflower oil for your omega-6 or omega-9 is your olive oil. So olive oil is a very neutral lipid, it's not um, pro or anti-inflammatory, um, whereas your omega-6 and your omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids give rise to either pro or anti-inflammatory cytokines and mediators and this then mediates the inflammatory response of your patient. So your Omega-3 um, polyunsaturated fatty acid gives you uh, anti-inflammatory um, mediators, whereas your omega-6 gives you pro-inflammatory mediators. So that's why the Americans have that guideline to try and restrict the um, administration of omega-6 um, IV lipid emulsions in their patients, because that is the, the lipid emulsion that they have registered for use in America, and only very recently were able to register fish oil containing lipid emulsion. So looking at IV lipid emulsions, there's been eight meta-analysis done in critically ill and surgical patients since 2010, which looked at mortality, morbidity, and length of stay in the ICU. I'm gonna go through some of those meta-analysis, um, and what you will see in most of them, they are con they're comparing fish oil containing lipid emulsions to your soybean lipid emulsion, which is your omega-6 lipid emulsion. Um, or then olive oil, which you need to remember is a neutral um, lipid emulsion, so that wouldn't have had much of an of a, um, inflammatory pro or anti effect. So this um, meta-analysis was published in 2012. It included 1,500 um, patients from 23 randomized controlled trials. And that's maybe not important, but what you need to remember is the outcomes of these studies. So what they found is no mortality difference, and I think um, for a nutrition study to show a mortality difference, um, that, that is not something that we see with nutrition studies. 
But what we find here is a 39% reduction in infectious morbidity if you give your patient a fish oil containing lipid emulsion, or almost two day reduction in ICU length of stay, three days reduction in, ICU, in hospital length of stay, and then far better liver um, parameters if you use a fish oil containing emulsion. This um, is another meta-analysis published in 2014, contained um, 21 randomized controlled trials with, again, almost 1,500 surgical patients this time. Again, look at a fish oil-containing lipid emulsion versus your predominantly omega-6 um, lipid emulsions. And again, there you see a 47% reduction in infectious morbidity, two-day reduction in hospital length of stay, and again, far more liver-friendly and significantly less pro-inflammatory cytokines um, in these patients. This, um, stud, this meta-analysis only included critically ill patients, um, 10 randomized control trials. Um, 10 randomized control trials included in this study. Um, and again, they looked at fish oil containing lipid emulsions versus um, a lipid-free bag or then bags containing predominantly omega-6 lipid emulsions. And again, 36% reduction in infectious morbidity if your patient got um, a fish oil containing lipid emulsion and almost four-day reduction in hospital length of stay, which didn't reach um, significance. And a one-day reduction, again, not reaching significance, but in mechanical um, ventilation. So at the moment, the ESPN guidelines say that a patient, as part of the PN, should um, give some. You should give some IV lipid emulsions, and I think we very rarely, if ever, use a, what we call a clear TPN bag. So a TPN bag that doesn't contain um, lipid in the ICU. We sometimes use it in our intestinal failure patients when we run into trouble with the liver, um, and we might use it in ICU in patients with excessively high triglycerides. So triglycerides over. Um, higher than about 10, you should switch to an electrolyte after a, a lipid-free bag. But otherwise, IV lipid should form part of your, of your PN. Um, it should not exceed 1.5 grams per kilo per day. And there again, you need to take your propofol um, into account if the patient is on propofol. And you should consider a blend of fatty acids. So um, that's to say more a more um, physiological blend, some, so something that contains uh, lipids coming from different sources and that is where your your SMOF lipid comes in so SMOF stands for soybean MCT olive and fish so it's a mix of lipids whereas your other TPNs contains predominantly soybean lipids so only coming from one source which is predominant omega-6 um, source and then you can um, include emulsions that's enriched with EPA and DHA which is your fish oil um, you should consider aspirin says you should withhold or limit soybean emulsions um, during the first week of ICU, and we, we've talked about that. And they then say that you should consider the use of fish oil lipid emulsions in critically ill patients receiving PN. So what you need to remember is that not all lipid emulsions are equal. They can alter the inflammatory response and ultimately alter the outcome of the patient. Um, if you want to give fish oil, you should aim for a dose of 0.1 to 0.2 grams per kilo per day. And we achieve that with um, the small containing bags that we use here. And then the, fish oil, the only fish oil containing lipid emulsion in South Africa is SMOF, which we get in the, in the all-in-one bags, but we'll chat about that a bit later. So then in terms of glutamine, um, and that's maybe something that we're talking about a lot less in the ICU, rightly so or not, I'm not sure. But glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in the body. Um, it occurs in the plasma normally at about in a concentration of, of about 500 to 900 micromoles per liter. And the de novo synthesis of it happens in the skeletal muscles at about 50 to 80 grams um, per day. So from there, it's exported to the splanchnic area where the enterocytes and the immune cells uses it as the predominant fuel source. But then during critical illness, it becomes a conditionally essential amino acid, not because um, production is altered, but because it's insufficient to keep up with demand. So we can give patients um, additional glutamine, um, either via the, the IV route or through enteral um, supplementation. So if you give it IV, you get a uniform uptake across the splanchnic area, a lot like you would do with your endogenously produced glutamine. And it's very fast eliminated from the plasma. Whereas if you give it entrally, it's absorbed in the upper part of the jejunum. You only recover a fraction of it in your portal blood. 
and very little um, reaches the systemic circulation because it gets used by the enterocytes in the gut and then again by, by the cells in the liver. So the rest of the gut and the immune function of the patient is, is then still deprived of glutamine. So the rationale for supplementation is that a low plasma concentration of glutamine at time of ICU admission is an independent predictor of unfavorable outcome. And this happens in about a third of ICU patients. But then also a very high plasma glutamine concentration is also a predictor of poor outcome. And that happens in a much smaller group of patients. And normally in your patients that present with acute liver failure or those with acute um, with chronic or acute on chronic failure uh, might have a high plasma level. And this is normal in, normally in terminally ill patients with multi-organ failure, um, which doesn't necessarily include liver failure. So it's basically a patient with a very poor prognosis that, that presents with um, high plasma levels. <clears throat> so if you look, so what happened was that up until I think probably 2011, 2012, we were able to provide patients with additional glutamine um, when they were in the ICU, which you could give in a 100 mole um, bottle that contained about 13 grams of glutamine. And then there was a study published which showed poor outcome in, in medic, predominantly medical patients who received high doses of IV and enteral glutamine in a combination. And after that, um, the, the South African PTC kind of removed um, glutamine from government tender, and therefore we're not able to use, to use it as a separate infusion anymore. But a lot of the all-in-one bags that you will see us use in, in the ICU does contain quite a large amount of glutamine, and you can then sometimes get to a therapeutic amount of glutamine. So if we just look at studies looking at glutamine, um, this is a 2014 meta-analysis um, which looked at the, the patient population glutamine dose and mode of nutrition support and then the influence of that on mortality and new infections. So if we look at mortality, there was a 23% non-significant trend for reduction in mortality in surgical ICU patients that you give glutamine to. Um, then in terms of dosage, if you give more than 0.5 grams per kilogram, there's increased mortality, which is what Redox did. And then in terms of new infections, there was a 30% significant reduction in new infections in surgical patients who received um, IV glutamine. And then also in terms of root, um, that they saw a significant reduction in new, in, in new patients, in new infections in patients who receive parenteral nutrition with glutamine supplementation. This is also a 2014 study looking at parenteral glutamine in critically ill patients. Again, a 32% reduction in hospital mortality, 2.5% uh, 2.5 day reduction in hospital length of stay if you provide patients with therapeutic amounts of glutamine um, as part of the, the PN prescription. Then in pancreatitis, um, specifically, glutamine plays a, a huge role in the outcome of those patients. So this um, meta-analysis only included four randomized control trials for patients receiving IV glutamine. And then in terms of mortality, they found a 74% significant reduction in mortality and a almost five-day reduction in length of stay and a 59% reduction in the rate of complications in patients with pancreatitis that you, that you provide IV glutamine to. So currently, the glutamine guideline from ESPN and ASPEN, and this is largely driven by the redox trial, which had a poor outcome. Um, ESPEN suggests that you should use enteral glutamine in patients with burns or critically ill trauma patients, or patients where you're trying to achieve, patients with large wounds, where you're trying to achieve wound dealing. In the, in the <coughs> general ICU, enteral glutamine is not um, indicated. And then in terms of IV glutamine, they don't really make a very bold statement. They just say, if you've got an unstable and complex ICU patient, particularly those with liver and renal failure, we should not be supplementing them um, with, with glutamine. And then aspirin, again, says not to use enteral glutamine routinely and not to use parenteral glutamine routinely. And I think very little of what we do in ICU with patients is actually ever routine. So um, in terms of that, if you... If you look at the effects of glutamine, it differs between patient population, the mode of delivery, whether you give it IV or enterally, the dose, and then also whether your patient was receiving parenteral nutrition or not. 
And the critically ill patient populations that will likely benefit are those um, from the surgical, the surgical ICU population, those with severe pancreatitis, your trauma and your burns patients. However, if you are using it, you shouldn't be giving more than 0.5 grams per kilogram per day. We should probably not use it in patients with multi-organ failure. And then if you're not providing patients with sufficient nutrition support, you should not be providing them with glutamine in isolation. You should probably think twice before you use it in your ICU um, population. So now I'm just quickly going to go through the different TPNs that we, that we have in, in the hospital. So this one you would have seen um, is the bag, the, the big single bag with a, with a blue um, handle. That's what we refer to as the all-in-one TPN. So that's the TPN that we, we get from a plant in Joburg where they mix all the, the admixtures and they, they make our bags according to some set um, prescriptions that we can use, we can choose a code from. Um, so these bags contain macro and micronutrients, so it's a complete solution. We can order them with or without electrolytes, and then there's quite a big variety with them in terms of your energy and protein ratios. The downside to them is that, that they have a very short um, shelf life, so you have to keep them in a the fridge, and then they only um, last in a fridge for seven days, um, so that's the, the expiry date that they come with. And on the other side, this is the only product in South Africa with a fish oil containing lipid emulsion. Then the other option that we have, and this was kind of forced on us a couple of years ago, is the multi-chamber TPN bag. So those are bags that you can keep on a shelf for two years. Um, so the pharmacy can keep a stock. The, the problem with them, however, is that they don't contain micronutrients. So you need to prescribe your micronutrients as a separate infusion. Um, which comes with more fluid, more changes on the central line, more risk of introducing sepsis in the patient, um, more risk of the micronutrients not being delivered to the patient, and obviously it also adds cost um, to the to the TPN. Um, but this is so it comes in three separate compartments. The one contains your carbohydrate, the other one protein, and the other one fat. And the bag will arrive in the ward in those separate compartments, and the nursing staff basically rolls the bag to break the seals between the, the compartments and that then mixes it and it gets administrated to the patient um, in that way. So if we just come back to the route that we've kind of been following. Um, so we've looked at the formulas in terms of TPN. If we just then quickly touch on the enteral formula. So if you want to divide your enteral formulas into into groups, there's probably about four groups that we talk about. So polymeric feeds um, is basically a plate of food in a bag. It's got whole protein, whole carbohydrate and lipids, and it comes with or without fiber. But the patient needs to have a competent gut in terms of ability to digest and absorb that feed. Um, the semi-elemental feeds is the, is the next um, category that we get. And in those feeds, the protein is broken down to peptides, so it's much easier to absorb. And they contain a significant amount of the fat in the form of medium chain triglycerides, which is also easier to absorb. And they contain, they, they're fiber free, and then they also come with different um, calorie concentrations. So that's a feed that we will use in a patient where you think the, the digestive or absorbed of capacity of the of the patient is impaired. Then the next one, which we never use um, in this hospital, is an elemental feed. We use it in the in the babies, um, but we there is an adult one available. It's a powder that you need to mix, but we've never really had a need to use that in in our patients. So that's an elemental one where the protein is broken down to amino acid form. And then the fourth one is also probably one that's disappeared <clears throat> mostly from use, but those are modular feeds where it's a polymeric feed, but it's made up a modular compartment. So we, we basically take a protein powder, we take a carbohydrate powder, and we use your normal sunflower oil that you fry your chips in at home, and we make up a formulation for the patient. Um, and the nice thing about it is that you can control how much protein and energy and whatever you want to put into the feed. Um, the downside of it is that it doesn't contain any micronutrients. And it's maybe also not the most hygienic 
thing to be using and we often find that the fat separate separates out and it's it's a bit messy um so we don't we don't often use modular feeds in the hospital anymore so just in terms of the feeds that we have the polymeric ones you can see um is listed there so that your original your original fiber nutrition low sodium diabin um, high protein energy support and in your 2k cal those are all feeds where patients need to be able to digest and absorb their feeds fully and they come in different concentrations of energy and protein our semi-elemental ones is servimet servimet hn and intensive and again you can see that there's a difference between the calories and the protein contents of these feeds um, and then if we just look at the selection of EN formula, so when we, Aspen says, when you start a patient on, on feeds, it's totally fine to start them on a polymeric feed. Um, we shouldn't be using speciality or disease-specific formula as a routine in ICU. And then if a patient has persistent diarrhea or you suspect malabsorption or lack of, with a lack of response to fiber, then you should introduce a peptide-based formulation. So if you have a patient with diarrhea, it may be worthwhile to try a fiber-containing formula, um, provided that that patient is stable and um, tolerating the feed well from a gastric residual point of view. Um, otherwise, you can switch to a, to a peptide-based or a servimet kind of feed. I think we use servimet a bit more. Um, it's kind of when in doubt, choose servimet, but um, we should probably be using it less in in our patients um yeah so then the aspen guideline also um says that the fiber a fiber containing formula should not be using routinely so when you start an icu patient on feed you're not going to choose a feed that contains fiber it does decrease your your gastric emptying um and it can it can have a, a detrimental effect on a patient with bowel ischemia or with a severe dysmotility. Um, so a feed like support and for instance that we use contain a bit of fiber, diabet contains a lot of fiber and we do often start patients on, on that as a startup feed but you just need to be um, aware of those, those contraindications. All right so that's the end of my presentation. I don't know if anybody has got any questions or would like to ask anything.